Hi, my name's Dale Linegar and it's great to be here. I'm the Director of Games for Change Asia Pacific and a Solution Architect at Obvious Choice. I'm also a researcher looking at how we can account for values in serious game design. For the last 15 years I've worked with a range of universities, corporations and organisations to create serious games and simulations for education and training. First I'd like to give you an idea of what I mean by the phrase serious games. That phrase in particular was first used back in 1970 by Clark Abt, but obviously we've been learning through play for thousands of years. So here are some examples from the Asia Pacific region. There is some great work being done in Malaysia, for example, by Mazaya Matt Rosley from the University of Malaya, who has been using exagaming or active video gaming to make physical activity for people living with a physical disability accessible, social and fun. Likewise, Swebo, a New Zealand based organisation, are using gaming technologies for physiotherapy and rehabilitation. SoftZen from Korea have created a virtual barista experience, which allows young people with special needs to do virtual job training. And Fields of View from India are using games and simulations to make better public policy. Chaibot VR from the Philippines are the production company behind Lutor VR an animated 3D virtual reality experience that highlights the difficulty some kids living on islands in the Philippines have swimming to school. Sound Scouts from Sydney, Australia are using games to test children's hearing in a fun and non-invasive way. And My Drive School, created here in Melbourne, provides an opportunity for young learner drivers to practice in a structured simulated environment. So serious games, simulations and virtual worlds are best used when traditional real-world learning methods are one or more of the following. Expensive, dangerous, logistically impossible, boring or not measurable. The picture in the background here is of firefighters playing the Tree Hazard Assessor game, which was developed by Obvious Choice in conjunction with Forest Fire Management Victoria. The game allows firefighters to walk through their hazarded workplaces, which is forest both before, during and after the fire, and learn about what measures they should be taking to identify and control risks. So this is a game that ticks all of those boxes. Let's examine them a little further. So firstly expensive, and with the cost of real world materials constantly going up and the cost of digital content going down, cost is increasingly a good reason to use serious games and simulations. And obviously with planes and fuel costing a small fortune, airlines have been using simulators for many years now to train pilots. The biotechnology simulations that we've developed for Monash University and BioCSL are another example. The equipment and materials used in creating these drugs can cost millions of dollars. By simulating these activities, students and workers can get experience of these processes at a fraction of the cost. The so second is dangerous. So after the aviation industry, the military is the second largest user of simulation and serious game technologies. So soldiers can train for a wide variety of battle scenarios without the risk of harm to themselves or others. Likewise, our nursing simulations allow students to practice procedures such as the administration of an IV fluid without putting real patients at risk. Our electrotechnology serious game allows students to practice installing an electrical service in a new residence without the risk of electric shock. So learning by making mistakes can be very powerful but in dangerous situations, it's often only possible if you're using a simulation or a serious game. And these days, we have situations where even, even gathering in a classroom can be dangerous. So COVID has made many traditional education and training practices dangerous, from run-of-the-mill classroom gatherings to things like teacher and health worker placements. So serious games and simulations can offer a worthy replacement for some of these activities. Third is logistically impossible. The third largest use of simulations and serious game technologies is in health. So virtual patients, for example, both physical and digital, allow students to practice a wide range of procedures which would otherwise be impossible to coordinate in the real world. For example, to practice cultural skills with a range of patients. And once again, learning from their mistakes. And our pharmacy simulators allow students to practice making medicine in a sterile environment something they don't have safe and constant access to in the real world. Fourth is boring. Now, our occupational health and safety serious game, the white card game, targets young school leavers who are just starting an apprenticeship and need to learn about workplace hazards. 
and this has been used by over 600 RTOs in Australia. It's important that this content is presented in an engaging fashion, as many of these young people do not respond well to traditional learning. Engaging students in this manner can ensure that when they do set foot on a work site, they know what hazards to look out for. So this lesson was really hammered home for me when we turned up to a TAFE that we were working with to find that a young apprentice had fallen off a scaffold and broken his back. The school was shut down as this was a workplace incident that needed to be investigated. So it's a very serious thing and learner engagement is often just viewed as making things easier for the learner or sort of sugarcoating things, but it's a lot more important when you're considering things like safety. Another way we use serious games and simulations to engage learners is by putting information into context. So our business simulations created for University of Melbourne and RMIT take traditionally quite dry topics and wrap them in an engaging storyline which engages the students and allows them to learn through play and experience rather than just memorising facts. And finally is not measurable. So you can measure every little action in a serious game or simulation and not just for assessment, but also for how you work with individuals and groups. So the first level of our tree hazard game for firefighters is used before a two day workshop to create risk profiles, which then inform the group creation and what topics the workshop leaders should be focused on. So it informs the training design, telling you where you should be focusing more of the instructional materials, and it can also drive improvements. And the Kilgore's management accounting simulations give the teachers advanced feedback, which then helps to drive classroom discussion. So when shouldn't you use serious games and simulations? So your use case should match at least a few of the reasons I just discussed. If you find the opposite is true, perhaps these technologies are not the right solution. For example, let's consider the potential for a virtual reality hammer simulation. Using a hammer or learning how to use a hammer is not expensive to do in the real world. Trade schools have hammers and they've got wood and they've got nails. It's not a particularly dangerous activity. Your average 16 year old school leaver or pre-apprentice has probably used a hammer before and can do it fairly safely. They might whack their thumb once or twice. Logistically, it's pretty easy. It's a lot easier actually to get a bunch of hammers, nails and wood than it would be to get 30 VR headsets up and running. Uh, it's not necessarily something that could be made more exciting by using digital technologies. Making something in the real world is much more tactile and enjoyable and it's relatively straightforward to measure the results. You can go around and look at how straight people are hammering nails into a piece of wood. So now let's look at four examples of serious games. The first I'd like to talk about is Pharmatopia, which was a project that we worked on with Monash University. This started in Second Life, which was a virtual world, then moved to OpenSim, then moved to Unity, and has now been republished as a HTML5 module through Articulate. Um, and they adopted a shared practice model, which initially engaged 10 universities from around the world. As well as the 10 universities, they also worked with CSL and GSK, two large pharmaceutical companies. And it's been this collaboration that has kept Pharmatopia alive. They've paid for some recent updates to some of the modules. Let me tell you about our interactive simulation called Pharmatopia. It's an online learning platform where students experience the process of making tablets. I would love to share the story of Pharmatopia and how it came into being, because we think the journey is as interesting as the end product. It's true that necessity is the mother of invention, and as pharmacists and scientists, we love a challenge. Before the creation of Pharmatopia, our students had a good grasp of active ingredients thanks to traditional teaching methods such as lectures and tutorials. And they demonstrated a clear understanding of tablets' physical properties, such as hardness and solubility. But the relationship between the various excipients that give tablets different physical properties was a difficult concept for most students to comprehend. We had one tableting machine and 200 students. On top of that, safety regulations had tightened so that teachers were the only ones allowed to operate the machine. This further removed students from having a hands-on approach to tablet making. We needed a creative solution for students to learn better. Our student learning objectives were clear. To demonstrate how ingredients in the tablet affect its properties and to explain the tablet making process. To engage our students and improve their learning, we wanted an active learning approach. We also wanted a realistic environment where students could formulate and make their own tablets, 
and where each person had a unique tableting problem to solve. After extensive research into different learning options, we decided to develop an online solution, which we called Pharmatopia. Being online, it could be accessed from anywhere in the university, or in the world for that matter. So now we had decided on a path, it was time to start building Pharmatopia. We did extensive research into games and simulations, collected our data, photos and videos, and contacted some online gaming specialists. We talked, they talked, we all listened, until bingo, Pharmatopia was formed. We felt proud of what we had achieved. Thanks to Pharmatopia, our students now have intimate, first-hand knowledge of tableting, and they seem to really engage with it. For us, Pharmatopia solves our problem. It's a huge win for both students and teachers. It's cost-effective too, as the online teaching expenses are small and the improvements in learning are large. Since the launch of Pharmatopia, other lecturers have shared their stories with us and we've developed many other modules. Now we've done all the hard work, we're keen to share our expertise to solve the challenges your students are facing. To develop your own Pharmatopia module, all you need is an idea. The next project I'd like to show you is Bogart. Bogart's a project that we did with RMIT University, and in particular, Professors Gillian Vesti and Eva Sahurudu. And it was about the accounting code of ethics. So this is something that sounds quite boring when I mention it to people. And if you look at the document itself, it's a very large PDF and it is quite boring. But then when you start to dig a little bit deeper, you realize it's a fascinating topic and it's perfect for gaming. So what do you do if you find out your company is laundering money as an accountant? And what are your obligations? You know, are they different if you work at a casino or if they're based in China? And what happens if you find out your client isn't paying workers pro properly? What happens if you find out that you're working for the mafia and you didn't know about it? And strangely, the answer to this is you can quit, but you don't have to dob them in if your life is in danger. So this game explores some of those issues and once again in quite a safe way. And then it concludes with some interesting sort of outcomes depending on how you acted throughout the game. We have a position for a senior accountant here at Bogart, and I thought of you. It would be a big step up from what you're currently doing. It's a great opportunity for your career. Welcome to Bogart Technologies. My name is Fred Stewart. I am the CEO. I'll tell you a little about how we work here. This console is where you do all your work. Your contacts, appointments, and reports are all in here. He's a great customer. But he lost a large government contract and needs a little compassion as he recovers. Fred has always been supportive. They're a good customer and friends with Fred. It's good that you're putting a little pressure on them. But make sure you don't go too far. I was just doing what I was asked to do. And we need to be flexible if we want to meet our performance targets. Changing a few dates isn't doing anybody any harm. I have been hearing good things that you are a team player and have learnt our systems quickly. Keep it up and you will go far. Obvious Choice worked with Forest Fire Management Victoria to develop a tree hazard assessor serious game in response to a coronial inquest held after the Black Saturday bushfires here in Victoria. It's not very well known, but trees present one of, if not the greatest risk to firefighter safety, and there are many deaths each year due to hazardous trees. For a firefighter, the forest is their workplace, so they need a safe way to learn about how to identify, mark and exclude tree hazards. The game is part of a blended learning program, which includes digital learning, workplace-based field trips and instructor-led training sessions. And as I mentioned before, the first level is a pre-course activity, which is used to evaluate an employee's understanding of the system of work and to reflect on the employee's appetite for risk. And then the, the remaining three levels are played after the instructor-led training course and form the post-course assessment for formal certification as a tree hazard assessor. And over 600 firefighters have been through this serious game and it's currently being updated in conjunction with the Country Fire Authority to a more user-friendly format. G'day, I'm Rob. I'm here to push some trees over for you. What's the plan? 
The next project I'd like to tell you about is Kilgore's, and this is an, a management accounting simulation which was developed by University of Melbourne in conjunction with RMIT. So what's of interest here is that they were collaborating even though they're just blocks away and many think people would think that they're in competition with each other. There's been three different modules developed, one for balanced scorecards, one for strategic investment, and one for profit planning, and it's free for anybody to use around the world. So there's currently over 10,000 students enrolled worldwide. It's used at University of Melbourne for MBA students and also at RMIT who have campuses in Melbourne, Singapore, Indonesia and Vietnam using it. It's also used by most other universities in Australia that are teaching accounting as well as universities across the US and in other countries like Saudi Arabia, France, Germany and Canada. The Kilgore's modules are digital-based interactive simulations constructed using gaming technologies. Kilgore's is a fictional multi-divisional company with a focus on the wine, hospitality and entertainment industries, which commenced in 1995 as a small wine company, but has now grown into a multi-divisional company that listed in 2006. The objectives of the Kilgore's simulation are to create a simulated classroom environment using contemporary technologies to explore management accounting issues. To simulate the industry and organisational environment for students through interactive virtual environments, video footage, accounting tools and spreadsheets. For students to engage in decision making about courses of action in response to changing circumstances for students to receive feedback on the implications of each of their decisions. There are currently three modules, Balanced Scorecard. I'm looking forward to seeing how a balanced scorecard might help us respond to some of our current challenges, as well as help align performance measures to divisional strategy. Our initial focus will be developing a scorecard to evaluate and monitor the overall performance of the division against the target. Strategic investments, Hi, it's a real pleasure to meet you and your timing is impeccable because we have such an exciting project to present to you today. It's our launch into the luxury resort category which will boost our brand across all the company's divisions. So we're really pleased to have you on board. Yes, thank you Charles. So the challenge facing each of our three project champions today is, is to present a compelling case for their particular project to be the right strategic investment for Kilgore's at this time. And profit planning. A series of reflections and discussion points are inserted throughout the simulations. That alignment score can't be right. What project could be more aligned with our strategy than this? This will keep our winemakers busy. Introducing a new product is costly and takes time. Are you sure this is the best response? We need action now. Feedback to the instructor on student decisions is available in graphical form to guide class discussion. And teaching notes are available. Simulations are currently being used by several universities across the globe and are available online for use by accounting educators worldwide. If you are an educator who would like to use the Kilgore simulations with your students, you can apply online at www.kilgores.com. So that brings us to the end of the presentation. I'd like to thank you all for your time. If you'd ever like to chat about serious games and simulations, as you might be able to tell by now, 
I'm always up for it. One of the greatest pleasures in my job is being able to look at the world from so many different perspectives. So please feel free to get in touch. Most of the work we do comes from a lot of chatting, collaboration, grant applications and time. And in October, we'll be hosting our first Games for Change Asia Pacific Festival, which will explore how games can be used for learning, health and social change. It's free, virtual and we'll have some fantastic presentations. So if you're interested, please sign up to our mailing list at apac.gamesforchange.org so we can keep you up to date. Thanks again and have a great conference.